Hello, I'm Ken Strauss. I'm an endocrinologist, and I am Global Medical Director at BD Diabetes Care. Hi, I'm Larry Hirsch. I'm the Worldwide Vice President of Medical Affairs, also at BD Diabetes Care. Hello, I'm Anders Fried. I'm a diabetologist, senior consultant at the Department of Endocrinology, University Hospital of Malmö, Sweden. This is a video overview of three papers which will soon appear in the Mayo Clinic proceedings. The first two are summaries of the Injection Technique Questionnaire ITQ survey. The first of the papers looks at the population parameters as well as injection characteristics of the survey, and the second at the complications and the role of the healthcare professional. Each of us is going to give an overview and the takeaways from one of the three papers, and I will start with the first one. The ITQ, the Injection Technique Questionnaire, involved more than 13,000 patients from 42 countries around the world. The main finding from this survey is that Needle length, the needle length that patients used to inject, which only five years ago was eight millimeters in over half the patients, has now undergone a sea change. And the new needle, which did not exist then, four millimeter, has caught up. And now 30% of patients around the world use the four millimeter just like the eight millimeter. The second paper also resulting from this <clears throat> ITQ survey has to do with complications and the role of the healthcare professional in optimizing injection technique th uh, in therapy. Uh, the most common complication that we discovered was lipohypertrophy, or what we sometimes refer to as lipos. This is enlargement of the fat cells, and clinically, this presents often as visible swelling and induration or hardening of the sub-Q fat, but sometimes it's not visible and it has to be sought by careful physical exam. The risk factors for this that are modifiable and seem to be the most important are repeated injections to the same site, i.e. poor uh, site rotation and needle reuse. Now, why do we care about lipohypertrophy? And the answer is because it is clearly a cause of reduction of insulin absorption and greatly increased variability. This leads to clinical glycemic variability and episodes of unexplained hypoglycemia. So what we really want to do with proper injection uh, technique is to try to optimize the consistency of delivery of insulin and the development of lipos and then injecting into them does the exact opposite. Now the clinical counterpart to this in our survey was that patients with lipos had worse glycemic control by over a half a percent hemoglobin A1C despite the fact that they were taking on average 10 units more insulin. So this is clearly reflecting the poor absorption and the variable absorption and this is a potential huge opportunity for health economic savings through trying to reduce or prevent or uh, mitigate lipohypertrophy. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there with my sort of key points and turn it over to you, Anders. Thank you, Larry. Well, the third paper, the new uh, insulin delivery recommendations, uh, proposed the answers to the questions raised by the ITQs. And it's um, structured in three, um, in three sections. There's delivery by injection, uh, delivery by infusion, and also the safety measures that must be followed. So the ITQ and, of course, the scientific evidence that is given in this paper uh, form the basis of, of uh, these recommendations. And the first draft of the recommendations uh, was written by an international scientific uh, advisory board made up of nurses, of um, diabetologists and educators. And the draft was then presented uh, at the Forum for Injection Technique and Therapy expert recommendations and we need the catchy title 
abbreviation for that, so it was called FITTER. And FITTER was held in Rome, Italy, from October 23rd uh, to 24th, 2015. And actually 183 doctors, nurses, education, um, educators and allied healthcare professionals were present from 54 countries. And they met to debate, revise and adapt uh, these recommendations. We call them recommendations because they are just that. I mean, they don't uh, have the compulsory or proscriptive uh, characteristics of guidelines or rules uh, from an international body. However, they are thoroughly evidence-based and they are grading according, uh, graded according to the strength of this evidence. And you'll find this in the paper. And the paper is divided into five sections, anatomy, physiology, pathology, psychology, and technology. Ken. So what does this mean practically? What implications do these recommendations and these papers have? Anders, could you give us your top line? Well, the key message is of course that no one needs a longer needle than four millimeters. Young, old, male, female, lean, obese. There is no medical reason to use uh, a longer needle. That's a key point. And another equally important message is that lipohypertrophy is prevalent. And the prevalence has not gone down between the two um, latest ITQs. And we also know from, from studies just published that the bioavailability of insulin may be up to 20% lower from a lipo. So that's really important. That is alarming. So I would echo what Dr. Fried just said. Um, I would underscore the shift to short in terms of needle length. Uh, there are over seven or eight papers now, randomized controlled studies that support the equal efficacy, less pain, better acceptance, preference uh, on the part of patients in controlled studies versus longer needles. There's a very interesting study published uh, in 2015 in the proceedings about uh, the use of the four millimeter needle versus eight and 12 millimeter needles in very obese uh, uh, American patients uh, with BMIs up to 59 and taking up to 350 units of insulin a day. And it showed the exact same thing, equal hemoglobin A1C levels, no increase in leakage, less pain, and so forth. I think the lipo issue is critical. We didn't mention, but multiple surveys around the world show prevalences of greater than 50%. So this is not some rare phenomenon, and it needs to be addressed. And healthcare professionals really just don't consider this, and they don't look for it uh, based on results of multiple surveys. So I think those are critical points. I would also mention that for safety, injection safety, particularly for the healthcare professional in an institutional setting, the institution has a responsibility to develop training and awareness about this, and healthcare professionals should be offered the use of safety engineered injection devices to avoid needle stick injuries. Ken? Let's close by talking about future steps, and I'll start. The ITQ was a huge survey, and we probably just scratched the surface with these two papers. There is a lot of material for individual countries to mine, to drill down in, and find out what their local situation is like. It will probably be very similar to what we found, but the impact will be much greater if they do that and they have local data. We've developed a tool, an online app, that will allow readers of these papers to go online and access their own data, drill down to their own country, their own center, and parse the data as they wish. And so this research tool is sort of an added value from these studies and could extend the impact of the ITQ. Uh, well, as a clinician, uh, I think we are in a very good position here because uh, the points you will find uh, in the new recommendations are easy to understand. They are often crystal clear. There are no buts or ifs, and they can be conveyed uh, with or without the uh, additional educational material. 
uh, and they can be used by everyone. Thank you all for listening and goodbye. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.